In January 1959, Ho Chi Minh and the Central Committee of the Vietnamese Communist Party, the highest political authority in North Vietnam, gathered for the 15th Party Plenum in Hanoi. The main issue on the agenda was the question of what to do about the continued partition of Vietnam. Promised election and reunification had not occurred. And instead, Ngo Dinh Diem had consolidated his power over South Vietnam. He was receiving substantial military and economic aid from the United States. And his regime was doing a distressingly effective job of harassing, suppressing, and destroying the communist Viet Minh guerrillas who had stayed behind in the hopes of sparking a popular revolution that would bring the South into the northern fold. These southern revolutionaries badly needed more help from North Vietnam. Otherwise, they might well cease to exist. So the question the Central Committee now faced was whether to seriously commit themselves to unifying the country by force. This would mean mobilizing their own population for war and funneling weapons, training, money, and other assistance to the insurgents. The Central Committee had to consider the attitude of the great powers to such a move. How would the Americans respond? And would the Soviets and Chinese support their actions? The latter question especially mattered because the North Vietnamese could not hope to prosecute any kind of substantial long-term conflict without massive aid from at least one, and preferably both, of the communist superpowers. As the plenum unfolded, the arguments for and against war raged back and forth. Cautious voices raised concerns that escalating the war would provoke an American intervention that might strengthen Ziem, perhaps even to the point where he could conquer the North. They also worried that the Soviets and the Chinese would shrink from supporting the cause of so-called liberation for fear of amping up global Cold War tensions. Yet a failure to fight partition might cause Diem's regime to become entrenched, similar to South Korea, where Syngma Rhee's autocratic U.S.-backed government was in no danger of falling. Within the Central Committee and its inner leadership known as the Politburo, two rival factions had emerged. On the one hand, there were the interventionists, or South First faction, who argued that it was the party's responsibility to take direct action to keep this kind of thing from happening. They pushed for an all-out military struggle to unify Vietnam by force. The most prominent and persuasive interventionist was Le Zuan, a fiery party stalwart who had by now logged many years on the ground in the South, carrying on the struggle. His wealth of practical real-world experience as an insurgent leader and his uncompromising personality made him a formidable figure. Ruthless and hard-headed, the zealous Le Zuan was not the sort of man to trifle with. There is no other path for the people of the South but the path of revolution, he had once written. Opposing the interventionists was the North First faction, who wanted to prioritize domestic policy and the economic development of North Vietnam, which had been deeply scarred by a decade of conflict with the French. They believed that a flourishing communist state in the North would win converts in the South, laying the path for a peaceful reunification by diplomatic means and or the referendum mandated by the Geneva Accords. For the first few years after partition, the North First faction was the more powerful of the two. Its leader was Chong Chin, then serving as general secretary of the party. And both Ho Chi Minh and Vo Win Zap were counted amongst its supporters. Accordingly, the focus of the North's efforts in its first years of formal independence was on internal development. Foremost was a massive program of land reform from 1953 to 1956, designed to end the extreme economic inequality and periodic famines of the colonial regime by redistributing farmland to many of North Vietnam's poorest and boosting agricultural production. On one level, the program was a great success. After three years, nearly a million hectares of land were divided amongst four million peasant farmers. Food output increased by nearly 60%, and the North's economy had not only recovered, but surpassed its peak under French rule. It also generated enormous loyalty for the party amongst the rural poor. Yet the program was hasty, and local authorities were given wide latitude to denounce, prosecute, or even execute landowners in the process. A violent wave of score settling and class conflict was unleashed across the country, with tens of thousands, including many intellectuals, business owners, and professionals, harassed or killed. Faced with such widespread abuses and outcry from prominent party members, in 1956, a tearful Ho Chi Minh admitted the party had made mistakes in its approach and apologized. 
General Secretary Chung Chin subsequently resigned, and the reputation of the North First Faction was damaged. Its position was further eroded that year when the deadline set in Geneva for a reunification referendum came and went. President Ziem, backed by the U.S., argued that the conditions did not exist for free and fair elections and refused to hold them. Within the Vietnamese Communist Party, support began to swing behind the war hawks. By the 1959 meeting, Le Zuan and the South First Faction were in the ascendancy. Ho went along with the new pro-war majority, but favored only a limited grassroots guerrilla war. He ordered communist operatives to focus on building insurgent organizations at the village level and fight only small battles designed to gradually weaken ZM's government until the day when international opinion and support might create favorable conditions for the North to finish them off and unite Vietnam. Ho asked the Soviets and the Chinese to support their southern push. He was disappointed when Nikita Khrushchev's government refused to help and urged him to give up the idea of taking over the South by force. By contrast, Mao Zedong and the Chinese fully approved of war and promised to provide Ho with $5 million worth of weapons and supplies. Had the Chinese not done this, North Vietnam might have had difficulty carrying out even this limited war in the South, and may have caused even Lei Zuan to think twice about the wisdom of the strategy. It's important to note that just as American support was vital for Saigon, so too Chinese and eventually Soviet support was every bit as crucial for the communist cause. Without outside sponsorship, neither of the Vietnams could hope to prevail in a war. Ho envisioned a gradual, long-term conflict that would lead to victory years in the future, perhaps even after he was gone. He could not know that once unleashed, the forces of war were going to accelerate beyond his control. Nonetheless, the decision to embrace a violent path to reunification further empowered the Southern First Faction. The next year, Le Zuan became Secretary General of the Party, a likely disappointment for Ho, who would have preferred a moderate in the post. Now nearly 70, though, Ho could no longer command the party as he once had. Though he remained a beloved figurehead and continued to influence Northern policy, Le Zuan and his allies were now firmly in the driver's seat. In December 1960, the Communists established the National Liberation Front, or NLF, a formal political face for the growing insurgency they were sponsoring in South Vietnam. The new organization announced that it aimed to, quote, overthrow the disguised colonial regime of the imperialists and the dictatorial administration, and to form a national and democratic coalition administration. The military arm of the NLF became known as the Liberation Army of South Vietnam, or LASV. President Diem dubbed them Viet Cong, or VC, a term that basically meant Vietnamese communists, and one that has remained predominant in historical posterity to describe both the political organization and its guerrilla forces. The NLF portrayed itself as a broad coalition of Vietnamese nationalists, including non-communists, who had joined forces with their communist countrymen to rid Vietnam of an imperialist puppet regime. To be sure, the NLF, for its entire existence, did include many operatives, especially in the countryside, who simply disliked the Saigon government and knew or cared little about communist ideology. But the reality was that the NLF was a communist organization. And though led by prominent Southern communists, the NLF ultimately took its orders from Hanoi. And it was sustained by weapons and other supplies covertly filtered to them from north to south. The composition of the NLF and the way it attempted to portray itself was strikingly similar to the Viet Minh of earlier years, defining itself as the only legitimate home for Vietnamese nationalism. But beneath this ersatz veneer, the NLF was a front controlled by uncompromising communists like Le Zuan. And they had zero tolerance for any other political opposition. So it cannot be said that this new guerrilla opposition to Saigon was entirely spontaneous and indigenous. Nor can it be said, though, that the insurgency in South Vietnam was entirely or even mostly of North Vietnamese creation. There was plenty of grassroots opposition to the ZM regime, especially in the poor and rural areas from which the Viet Cong readily attracted recruits and supporters. In 1954, the U.S. pressured ZM to embark upon land reforms like the Norse to win greater rural support and break up the colonial era plantations. In many areas, though, the Viet Minh had already redistributed land during the insurgency against the French, and the South's program was far less aggressive and less generous. Corruption and opportunism ran rampant, with many large holdings remaining untouched. 
and some landlords had amassed more land rather than less by the end of the process. In the end, the program achieved little and stoked further resentment in the countryside. Hanoi nurtured, grew, and expanded this existing opposition through a calculated and ultimately massive effort to make war on South Vietnam. To use a simple analogy, the North Vietnamese turned an already existing brush fire into an enormous conflagration. NLF operatives began assassinating Saigon government officials, ambushing government troops, and establishing shadow governments in rural villages. On the military side, there were two principal kinds of Viet Cong guerrillas, local force and main force. Local force insurgents function as part-time militia, usually in their own home villages. They focus on recruiting, gathering intelligence, political agitation, along with sniping and ambushes against government officials and troops. Main force Viet Cong were better trained, better armed, full-time soldiers who operated beyond their own homes. As the war expanded, main force battalions became a formidable military force, capable of taking the fight to DM's troops and ultimately the Americans. As Viet Cong attacks and sabotage started to create serious headaches for DM, fighting also raged in neighboring Laos between monarchists, non-communist rightists, and communist guerrillas known as the Pathet Lao. The North Vietnamese and the Soviets were providing aid to the Pathet Lao and the Americans supported, at various times, both of the non-communist groups. This proxy war in Laos could well have led to a direct confrontation between the superpowers. For a short time, the Americans even contemplated sending in troops. But in 1961, newly inaugurated President John Kennedy pivoted away from intervention in Laos, as did Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. At an international conference in Geneva involving 14 countries, the Americans and Soviets brokered a peace settlement that established a shaky coalition government in Laos with a kind of power-sharing arrangement. The foreign powers pledged neutrality and agreed to cease all military involvement. The Laotian settlement had good and bad points to it. At a time when events in Cuba and Berlin had seriously ramped up Cold War tensions, the Laotian settlement represented a welcome diminution of hostilities heading off another potentially dangerous confrontation between America and the Soviet Union. But it also had ominous future consequences. The idea that the warring Laotian groups could set aside their differences in favor of a coalition-style government was never realistic. The Civil War boiled on, unabated, and the Pathet Lao established a firm hold on the eastern regions of the country that bordered Vietnam. Moreover, the North Vietnamese never withdrew their troops. Instead, they joined forces with the Pathet Lao and cultivated increasingly sophisticated bases and routes to funnel weapons, food, and other supplies to the Viet Cong. This was the logistical network that generally became known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and it played a pivotal role in the sustainment and perpetuation of communist resistance to the Saigon regime. In response to this, the Americans waged a clandestine, CIA-led war of their own joining forces with local tribes in hopes of sabotaging communist influence. Eventually, of course, the Americans would conduct a major air campaign and run special operations raids into Laos as well. The Laotian settlement may have averted a wider war, but at the terrible price of ceding a vital sphere of influence to the North Vietnamese, and one that would plague the American war effort in Vietnam. In short, the Americans never really solved the Laotian problem and they would pay a heavy price for this failure. And in the South, the Viet Cong were posing ever more of a threat. Insurgents blew up bridges, dug tunnels, assassinated officials, and terrorized villagers. In some regions, Diem's regime was losing control entirely. In early 1960, Win Thi Dinh, one of the few female commanders of the war, led a mass uprising in the impoverished riverine province of Ben Tre that toppled the local authorities. By 1961, the VC had taken effective or partial control over numerous rural districts, particularly along Vietnam's border with Cambodia and Laos, into which northern supplies could easily infiltrate, and in the Mekong Delta, where local resistance to the Saigon regime had already been strong. These areas controlled by the VC would become critical to the insurgency, providing food, supplies, intelligence, labor, shelter, and logistical support to the communist forces throughout the war. With the insurgency growing rapidly and Diem's regime losing its grip, it now fell to President John Kennedy to determine how the Americans should respond. 
Like his predecessors Eisenhower and Truman, Kennedy believed in the domino theory. And it was clear to him that the conflict in South Vietnam was now both a civil war and a Cold War contest. The growth of the Viet Cong could not possibly have happened without North Vietnamese and Chinese assistance. And if the United States stood by and allowed Diem to face his threat unaided, containment might be rendered meaningless, and the security of America's Asia-Pacific allies, such as Thailand, the Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, could be compromised. Communist victories in Southeast Asia might also imperil Malaya and Indonesia, both of which were plagued with tenacious communist insurgencies. Kennedy's Cold War policy emphasized the concept of flexible response. It was designed to contain communism by reinforcing American advantages in nuclear weaponry, sea power, and air power, while also developing viable means of combating communist uprisings at the grassroots level in contested areas like Vietnam. This meant counterinsurgency warfare. And it called for Americans to immerse themselves in the culture on the ground, work closely with local military forces, and defeat enemy guerrillas at the village level. The Army's newly created Special Forces units were especially suited to this socio-military mission. Its soldiers were hand-picked volunteers who survived intensive training for combat and cultural savvy that equipped them to win both firefights and local hearts and minds. Kennedy's instinct, then, was that America had to contain the insurgency in South Vietnam. If we have to fight in Southeast Asia, let's fight in Vietnam, he told Dean Rusk, his Secretary of State. If South Vietnam should fall, a wave of domination by Communist China could then sweep over Southeast Asia. At the same time, the president was leery of becoming enmeshed in a protracted war, and he had no wish to send large numbers of American troops to Vietnam. And he worried the mere act of sending them would inevitably lead to persistent demands for more. It's like taking a drink. The effect wears off and you have to take another, he quipped. Doubts that Kennedy occasionally expressed about involvement in Vietnam would give rise in later decades to simplistic arguments by some filmmakers and authors that Kennedy strongly favored disengagement, and had he not been assassinated in 1963, he would have steered the United States clear from a major war. The truth was far more complex. He certainly expressed plenty of doubts about Vietnam, and he worried that a worsening situation there might imperil his chances for re-election in 1964. But his actions indicated a man who had no intention of abandoning the South Vietnamese regime. And he acceded to ZM's request to step up the pace of aid. When Kennedy took office in 1961, there were about 700 American military personnel in the country. By the end of 1962, there were about 11,000. And at the time when he was assassinated in November 1963, that number had swelled to 16,000. Euphemistically described as advisors, some were special forces soldiers who worked closely with South Vietnamese militiamen and soldiers at the village level, and often personally fought against the VC. Most of the advisors, though, served in a non-combat capacity as administrators, planners, and logisticians to coordinate the many millions of dollars worth of U.S. aid and military hardware pouring into the country. The Kennedy administration created a new organizational structure called Military Assistance Command Vietnam, or MACV and placed General Paul Harkins, who had served as George Patton's Deputy Chief of Staff during World War II, in command. The Americans provided the South Vietnamese with transport aircraft, helicopters, and enough resources to expand the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVN, to about 200,000 soldiers. Buoyed by the growing American assistance, the Diem regime in the early 1960s expanded its counterinsurgent efforts against the Viet Cong even though the insurgents were now receiving more support from Hanoi and Beijing. It was becoming a mutual escalation death struggle to decide the future of Vietnam. In an attempt to isolate and destroy the VC, Diem's government created the Agraville program. Mainly centered in the troublesome Mekong River Delta, government officials uprooted rural Vietnamese from their home villages and placed them into fortified compounds surrounded by barbed wire, fences, and guards. Ostensibly, the compounds were designed to protect people from VC encroachment. But to many bewildered peasants who now found themselves living away from their ancestral homes, cooped up inside the compounds, forced to commute under government supervision just to tend their fields, the Saigon government seemed like much more of a threat to their liberty than the VC. Plus, most of the government officials were educated urbanites, with little affinity for or connection with rural people, many of whom they looked down upon as rubes. <laughs> 
The Agraville program failed miserably because essentially it deprived people of their freedom, all in the name of protecting their freedom. And obviously this made no sense. In 1962, the regime tried a different tactic with the more extensive and farther reaching strategic Hamlet program. The idea had a successful historical precedent in Malaya in the 1950s, where the British had helped defeat communist guerrillas by providing the population with local security, and the ZM government attempted to replicate it. Instead of moving peasants into specially created compounds, the government erected fortified perimeters around existing villages and smaller settlements known as hamlets. Now this solved the problem of uprooting people from their ancestral homes, but it did also force them to labor on the fortifications with no compensation, creating some resentment. Saigon hoped to create a well-connected network of formidable fortified hamlets, impervious to Viet Cong influence. The insurgents would then be deprived of their village hiding places, along with much of their sustenance and support until, in the colorful words of one Kennedy administration official, they were reduced to, quote, hungry marauding bands of outlaws, devoting all their energies just to survive. Diem set the goal of establishing at least 7,000 strategic hamlets by the end of 1962. This was far too ambitious and encouraged a tendency for the government to overvalue superficial metrics, such as whether a fence was built or barbed wire strung, to evaluate the security of the village. Corrupt officials sometimes appropriated program funds for themselves. Heavy-handed administrators occasionally behave with arrogance and stupidity. In Malaya, the British strategy had worked in part because most communist operatives were of Chinese heritage and thus ethnically different and often easy to distinguish from the rest of the population. But because of the relative ethnic and linguistic cohesiveness of the Vietnamese, Viet Cong guerrillas remained difficult to identify and separate from everyone else. Too often, they were the every man and every woman. Eventually, Viet Cong local and main force units took to attacking hamlets, challenging the Arvin to defend them. And for obvious reasons, the government had great difficulty building strategic hamlets in VC-dominated areas, and nowhere near enough rural villagers felt real loyalty to Saigon. Diem claimed that as of 1963, about 7.3 million people were living under the protection of the program. But a more objective American study asserted that only about 18% of hamlets could be considered secure in any way. And those numbers never really improved significantly. In the big picture, though the strategic hamlet program represented an innovative and potentially effective approach to counterinsurgency, it did not fulfill its purpose of defeating the guerrillas at the village level. Was the strategic hamlet program misbegotten or a missed opportunity? The bulk of Vietnam War historians fall into either the orthodox or the revisionist school of thought. Orthodox historians argue that the war was an unwinnable, tragic disaster. Some of them further contend that it was immoral and wrong. By contrast, revisionist historians believe that South Vietnam and the United States were right to oppose communism and could have won the war if they had fought it differently, in particular by prioritizing the pacification of the countryside to defeat the communists at the grassroots. Not surprisingly, historical viewpoints about ZM's role in these critical years remain mixed. Orthodox historians have portrayed him as a dynamic but overly repressive dictator who presided over an unpopular regime that had little legitimacy and no appeal to the average Vietnamese, especially in the countryside. To make the case for his ineffectiveness, they especially point to his incarceration of political opponents, some of whom were not even communists, and his persecution of Buddhists. Revisionists concede the point that he was authoritarian, but argue that this was typical and expected in the context of Vietnamese politics, and at any rate, whatever his depredations, they paled in comparison with the horrifying brutality of the communists. In the revisionist view, Diem had every bit as much of a legitimate claim to Vietnamese nationalism as did Ho Chi Minh and the communists. He was a personally honest, intellectually brilliant leader who was totally committed to establishing a post-colonial, independent, non-communist future for his country, and, so the argument goes, he proved more effective in combating the Viet Cong than Orthodox historians had admitted. In short, the revisionist sees Diem as a true communist nemesis, a singular leader who could defeat the Viet Cong and foil North Vietnam's goal of uniting the country under communism. Regardless of how you evaluate Diem, there's no doubt that by 1962, the fury and intensity of the war in South Vietnam was growing, and his regime now faced a crisis. The Department of Defense estimated that at least 10% of South Vietnam's villages were under VC control. 
and they exerted influence at another 60%. Arvin was stretched to its limit, fighting increasingly desperate battles against the rapidly growing force of communist guerrillas. The number of American advisors continued to increase, even as the Kennedy administration searched in vain for a clear path to victory and stopped short of going in wholeheartedly. In the North, the communist leadership, three years after making their fateful decision to unify Vietnam by force, was also facing a quandary. Though the VC had made significant inroads in the countryside, their influence in the key cities and settlements was minimal, and their guerrillas could not match the American trained and supplied Arvin in open battle. Despite the ascendancy of the interventionists, heavy debate broke out whether to further escalate the war in the South, to truly take the fight to Ziem, and how much of their limited resources they could devote to doing so. Their divisions reflected a growing schism between the Soviet Union and China. The Soviets urged de-escalation in South Vietnam and in Cold War tensions as a whole. The Chinese pressed for a wider conflict in Southeast Asia and world revolution overall. The divisions in Hanoi inevitably reflected these opposing perspectives. So really, both sides in Vietnam were now searching for some way to strike a mortal blow and avoid the catastrophe of defeat. As we'll see in our next lecture, a major chapter in the tragic history of the Vietnam War was about to unfold.